Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, BGP Incidents, A Brief History and How to Prevent Them, presented by Kentix Technologies. I'm Mary Grace Stevenson, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I'd like to start off by introducing today's speaker, Doug Midori, Director of Internet Analysis at Kentic. You can read his full bio on the left side of your window by selecting the Speakers tab. I have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. To access additional resources, a copy of today's slides, and other helpful resources from today's presentation, please click the Handouts tab on the, but on the bottom left side of your screen. I'm sorry, left top side of your screen. You can access closed captions from the bottom right corner of the video player. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand within 24 hours. One last thing, during the presentation, we'd love to hear from you. Please submit any questions you have using the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen, and time permitting, we will conclude with a Q&A session. With all of that said, we're ready to begin. Doug, please go ahead. Uh Thanks. Um, so, yeah, as, um, as was mentioned, my name is Doug Midori. I'm the Director of Internet Analysis of Kentic, and the title of my talk is A Brief History of the Internet's Biggest BGP Incidents. So let me tell you a little about how this uh, talk came to be. So last year, in 2022, the FCC, which is the a body, a regulatory body in the U.S. government that oversees communications in the United States, uh, took an interest in BGP. There had been a lot of stories about uh, hijacks, uh, outages, leaks, and they, uh, I think February, published something soliciting uh, input from the industry as to what should they be doing uh, to try to improve this part of uh, internet communications, which underpin all of uh, you know modern day society. So. Uh, there were a lot of reactions to that, and one was um, this group BTAG, which represents the broadband carriers of the United States, was able to assemble a who's who of all of the the names in the world of BGP, all the top experts of the world, to assemble uh, to write a, a comprehensive report detailing you know, the history of the protocol, the issues that it had, um, uh, that it had, the um, uh, what are recommendations and uh, for both policymakers, meaning people in government, as well as network operators, uh, a variety of things. It's 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 worth your time to take a take a look at it. So I was a part of that team, and one of the my main contribution was writing up a little history. So if someone was new to the topic, here's the history of all the incidents that took place, uh, and the reason why I might be qualified to do that is that uh, since the year 2009. I have been uh, writing about BGP mishaps uh, from a company called Renesis I was with uh, many years ago. Later, uh, we got acquired by Dyn, and then I got acquired by uh, Oracle, and then I moved on to Kentic here, where I've been for the last three years. Uh, this has been something I've been covering for a long time, and I've, I think I've written as much as anyone uh, has on this topic. So I decided this year I would go ahead and publish my own version of what I had my contribution to the BTAG report. Uh, that's available on the uh, Kentic blog. Uh, these links are clickable in the handout version of the, the PDFs. Um, and this this has been reposted in a number of places. Uh, Nanog reposted this on their own uh, uh, website. I think APNIC uh, republished this. And then uh, earlier, just a few weeks ago, LACNIC uh, uh, did a translation and published this in Spanish. Para los volantes de Espanol. So if uh, there's a there's a longer written form, but let me take you through uh, the highlights in this talk. And to get started, we have to go way, way, way back into ancient history, all the way back to 1989. So this uh, protocol was invented during a break at an IETF meeting. IETF meetings were happening uh, all, uh, back in 1989, uh, where a couple engineers over lunch tried to figure out how would they uh, come up with a, a scalable protocol that would be able to uh, enable an exchange of information, of routing information between networks of the world. And they wrote up this uh, uh, plan on a few napkins that have become his, uh, history, although it's maybe appropriate that we still uh, debate over how many napkins. It was either a two napkin or three napkin protocol. 
well, whatever it was, um, we uh, you know we have the, we have copies of the napkins. It's maybe two three sides of two napkins. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot of napkins involved. But if you take anything away from this talk, it's you know we if we're going to secure uh, BGP, uh, we're going to need a whole lot more napkins uh, and a lot more specification. So let me get into uh, the the. Uh, the, the issues here, the incidents, because we, we focus on where the protocol fo uh, fails uh, as a way to try to identify what, where, we need, where, we need, where do we need to work on improving uh, the protocol and how it operates. So why don't we take a little stroll through uh, these incidents? Obviously, the written uh, report has got a lot more stuff in it, but um, let's... Uh, I'll just hit on some highlights and just remind ourselves, why are these things problematic? And they typically fall into two categories. Either there is a disruption of uh, legitimate internet traffic as a result of a BGB incident, a leak or otherwise, or uh, there is a mis misdirection of communications that creates some sort of a risk of interception or manipulation. Occasionally an incident might be in both categories, but typically they fall into one or the other. It's worth worth uh, you know just orienting yourself to how uh, uh, how we categorize these incidents, and then also when I speak to people uh, who um, uh, about BGB incidents, I try to uh, uh, convey that there this is a constellation of problems. Uh, it is not just a single thing that one technology will fix. We have a, a and we have a spectrum of incidents uh, that we're trying to address. Problems we're trying to address, and on one end are just the bonehead errors. So we, you know, someone fat fingering a route or uh, an AS misoriginating, uh, you know, the routing table. As we'll talk about, uh, you know, we have to have our global routing system be resilient to survive those inevitable errors that happen. As long as humans are typing into routers and maybe AI will make mistakes too, um, uh, we're gonna have errors and we have to be able to have the internet not collapse when there's a, a, a just a, a, an innocent mistake. Um, and then on up uh, through that spectrum, at the other end is a determined adversary. So this is the, the, the phrase used uh, when we look at a routing attack that is done by an actor, a bad actor that has very um, good understanding of internet infrastructure and the weaknesses of uh, how the internet works. And we have plenty of examples of, of those as well. And so those are much more difficult uh, to solve, but um, we did, Basically, we needed to try to address some of the bonehead stuff first to work our way up. Because uh, you know, when I started doing this back in 2009, honestly, we really couldn't do much in anywhere on the spectrum. We were we were uh, fighting off bonehead errors uh, regularly, and it doesn't it didn't free up time to work on that determined adversary. I feel like we're we're starting to get there, but it's it, there's lots of unsolved problems on that end of the spectrum. And so let's start with uh, disruptions due to leaks. So there is a RFC 7908, which is uh, a RFC on routing leaks that provides a taxonomy of the various scenarios of leak, leak scenarios that uh, are commonly seen. Uh, there's, there's quite a few. I think there's at least six in that scenario. Um, you know, broadly, they define a route leak as uh, you know, propagation of routing announcements beyond their intended scope. So I think that's a that captures a lot of it. Uh, for me, I think it's useful to break this down into just two categories. One is an origination leak, and that means an AS uh, appears to be the origin, be the rightmost AS and AS path of routes that it's not supposed to. So uh, that's an origination leak. And then an adjacency leak where a route uh, comes in uh, through an AS from one direction and goes out the wrong way. So that can be uh, coming in from one transit provider and going out to another transit provider that it creates a valley and we want to have a valley free uh, routing uh, environment or in through a peer and then out through a transit provider or so there's a there's a number and that's that's what the that RFC covers all those scenarios but in the end they're all in my opinion adjacency leaks uh, and they require uh, a different uh, solution than the origination leaks. So let's just take a minute about talk about these origin leaks. So the very first internet disruption caused by a routing leak was an origination leak back 
again, in ancient history in 1997, this AS7007 uh, uh, routing leak. There is a Wikipedia page on this incident. Uh, in this case, there was a router bug that caused uh, an a this AS7007 to deaggregate the entire global routing table into slash 24s and announce it as if uh, 7007 was the origin. This caused uh, the internet to send for as, as far as those routes would propagate, which it was pretty far since they were more specifics, it would send traffic uh, to AS7007, overwhelming it and uh, creating a, a large outage. One of the issues that uh, plagued this particular um, uh, this particular incident was that the um, uh, when the r problematic router was removed from the internet, uh, those uh, routes, uh, the leak routes, were still in circulation for a long time. It took a lot of work to try to clean that out of the global routing system. It's a problem that we don't have so much uh, uh, today. Um, otherwise, uh, there has been a number of large origination leaks uh, since uh, 2000, uh, since that 7007, uh, there was a Turk Telecom leak in December 2004, a China Telecom leak that uh, in April 2010 that got a lot of people in the US government concerned that this might be some sort of an attack. There's tele Telecom Malaysia, Indosat, there's been a number of major internet uh, origination leaks. Although I would point out that we just, we haven't seen uh, a, uh, a big one in a long time, and that's progress. Uh, again, back to that uh, scale or that spectrum from bonehead to determined adversary. Uh, this visualization is uh, from a talk I gave at Nanog in uh, the beginning of 2020, uh, where the um, I, I looked at how far the routes of a leak propagated. And so in this case, the China Telecom leak leaked about 50,000 routes. However, uh, the vast majority of those did not propagate very far. Uh, in fact, if you were to look at the ones that propagated far, so the farther it propagates, the more disruption it would cause. The ones that were uh, propagated far were other Chinese routes. Uh, the ones that were of concern to the U.S. government, like the D U.S. Department of Defense, they propagated, uh, they didn't propagate very far, and they didn't uh, last very long. So uh, I, I think this was... Uh, that that led to a lot of people to look at this and say this is just another mistake. Although, when China's involved, uh, people get suspicious. Um, I'll mention now this uh, this kind of hybrid incident because it doesn't quite fit into a couple of categories. These are leaked hijacks, which are intentional but also accidental. Uh, the 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 best example of this is probably the most famous BGP incident. Uh, yet so far on the internet, which was Pakistan uh, trying to block uh, YouTube uh, locally by using um, PTCL, the state telecom, would uh, announce address space uh, of YouTube's address space and try to black hole the traffic. In the event, uh, by accident, they announced this out onto the internet and it disrupted YouTube around the world. Um, this is something that we continue to see. Uh, and it's, again, there's a, uh, you know, the, um, the hijack was intentional, but it was intended to stay within uh, within Pakistan. It was also uh, accidental, and then it leaked out on the internet. And so, in recent years, we've seen more cases of this kind of thing, uh, starting with uh, the 2001 Myanmar military coup. In the aftermath of the t military takeover, there was a crackdown on social media, and one of the providers in Myanmar elected to use BGP to try to block uh, Twitter by announcing, uh, originating a, uh, and hijacking a uh, the slash 24 belonging to Twitter, aka X. Uh, and by mistake, they announced this uh, uh, out to the internet via an ex internet exchange in Singapore. And there were providers around South Asia that, uh, you know, the customers of these providers had problems reaching Twitter while this route was in circulation because it, their traffic was getting redirected to this provider in Myanmar who was black holing it. Um, the following year, um, almost the same time frame, uh, after the Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, you know, there's the blowback in Russia and Russia had a crackdown on independent media and social media. And again, a, a provider in Russia elected to try to black hole traffic to Twitter by, uh, again, originating this uh, 
Twitter prefix, same one, uh, and they too mistakenly announced it out to the internet. Uh, the difference between the that incident in 2021 and 2022 was that in the interim, uh, Twitter had rolled had rolled out RPKI, and so what they had done was create ROAs, so route origin authorizations that would communicate to the internet what is the proper origin of this uh, route that enabled other providers then when uh, when the Russian uh, provider uh, hijacked this and it leaked out to the internet uh, other providers were able to recognize that instantaneously as uh, wrong and were able to reject it uh, so that it didn't propagate very far and um, when I spoke to engineers at Twitter about these two incidents, they say that they felt like RPKI did a very good job at limiting the disruption and that the traffic that they lost uh, compared to the, uh, for the two incidents was uh, drastically different and it was much better. And then just a few weeks ago, we had another incident, a uh, similar one where uh, the Iraqi government elected that they felt Telegram, there was an issue with uh, tel uh, accounts doxing people uh, on um, uh, Iraqi uh, people and Telegram. So the Iraqi government needed to block Telegram. So their government network that uh, 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 operates as an inter uh, international gateway to um, Iraq uh, announced the Telegram address space. Again, it leaked out uh, accidentally. And so there were providers outside of uh, Iraq that um, were uh, picking this up. However, uh, Telegram also had um, uh, created ROAs uh, so, uh, to communicate through RPI what is the proper origin. And so that enabled um, transfer providers and lots of um, providers down the world to reject uh, the um, hijack from the Iraqi government. And uh, there really was very little uh, disruption reported outside of uh, outside of Iraq. We couldn't help the folks in Iraq, but um, you know, these in these cases, uh, we're trying to limit the the collateral damage to these incidents. So that was the um, you know the intentional but uh, accidental incidents. Uh, here are some more accidental things. So these are adjacency leaks, and they're, it's important to uh, separate these out from the origins, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So we'll talk about a couple of these. One was this main one leak from uh, November 2018. Uh, the main one was accepting uh, routes from content providers. They leaked them to their trans providers, uh, so that would uh, redirect traffic. Uh, they should be just sending those into their, keeping them within their customer cone, but they now seems out to the internet meant that providers around the world would potentially send traffic to Nigeria to get to Google or Cloudflare or whoever else was impacted. Uh, in this case, they had a leak. It was China Telecom that <clears throat> leaked this out onto the internet. Um, and, uh, and so then again, that uh, caused a lot of concern that there was maybe something um, uh, intentional about this. Uh, to their credit, uh, main one within a couple of hours posted on a number of forums uh, that they had done a quick investigation. It was their mistake. Uh, you know, they apologized and you know, nobody's perfect here. Uh, that was the right thing to do to just uh, fess up. Otherwise, uh, again, people were getting very concerned that there was some sort of an attack. And then the following year, there was this Allegheny Tech leak uh, that probably is the last you know, ma major routing leak that was super disruptive, uh, I, I would argue. Uh, in, in this case, you had a, a provider taking routes from one uh, from one of its transfer providers and announcing uh, to another. But in this case, there was a route optimizer involved, and so this route optimizer operates by uh, creating, fabricating uh, more specific uh, routes into the routing table of the network that's using it. And, uh, and so when those leak out, those more specifics trump any less specifics. So when I'm saying a more specific, we're talking about like a slash 24 beats a slash 23, that kind of thing. Um, you know, not they, they leaked 29,000 routes, but not every one of those was a more specific. There was about only about 200 or so, but most of those were Cloudflare and Akamai. So there was some sort of traffic engineering uh, for content providers that was going on uh, uh, that the Strat Optimizer was trying to uh, optimize. And um, uh, as a result, when those leak, those routes leaked out, uh, those co those content providers were um, were affected. But I think the point that I make uh, about separating the JCC leaks from the origin leaks is that you know in these cases those origins were intact. So I've got an example of the leak Google Path uh, in 
red and maybe hard to see, that's main one. Green is Google uh, in the you know, Cloudflare for uh, a, a cloud, Cloudflare route that was impacted by Allegheny. You've got red as the Allegheny networks and green was um, uh, one through three, three, five for uh, Cloudflare. Uh, so the, any kind of origin based uh, mechanism is not gonna help here. Uh, I would point out that you know Cloudflare at the time in 2019 made a uh, made a point that had Verizon, who was the ultimate network that leaked this out to the internet, had they been uh, had they deployed RKI uh, and were performing ROV, so route origin validation, then it, uh, it wouldn't have been as uh, it wouldn't have been a, as impactful of an incident, and that's true. But not because, <laughs> excuse me, but not because of the origins. It's because uh, the route optimizer announced more specifics. And when Cloudflare creates its ROAs, the ROA, the, the maximum prefix length is another setting, optional field in a ROA. Uh, they keep the maximum prefix uh, settings to match the routes as they are announced by Cloudflare. Uh, and that would potentially prevent a route, route optimizer from circulating more specifics in this case because uh, Verizon was not rejecting invalids then uh, those routes uh, are continued on anyway so that's um, that's the discussion between origin and adjacency leaks so you know you might look at uh, some of these stories and I, I see this a lot as someone who writes about BGP of people kind of throwing up their hands and saying you know uh, Bridging gap protocol, it's hopeless. You know, the, um, uh, the famous faux pas uh, uh, in the aftermath of the Facebook outage from a couple of years ago, almost almost uh, two years to the day. Um, and I guess I'm here to defend uh, BGP a little bit because a lot of these out, uh, incidents, BGP is more of a symptom than the cause. There are certainly inherent uh, protocol uh, issues with the protocol. Uh, and uh, that need to be addressed. And there's an active discussion around those, but um, on a lot of these, like the Facebook outage or the Rogers outage or the Azure outage earlier this year, in each case, uh, the the BGP withdrawals that we see were really a symptom versus the, the cause of the outage. But yeah, uh, bridging gap protocol, I think we all had a good laugh over that. I don't know where he got that, oh no. <laughs> It didn't come from me, I promise. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, I I make this point and when I do this discussion of like, you know, when was the last debilitating routing leak? Uh, was it Allegheny Tech in 2019? I mean, that's a that's a number of years ago. That's over four years ago now. Um, are our fingers getting less fat? Uh, it's certainly not the case, right? We're we're getting better as a routing system of being able to overcome uh, and be resilient in the face of the inevitable errors that uh, uh, take uh, take place. So there's routing filters, uh, RPKI is a big uh, part of this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that people have worked on and maybe, maybe some people in the audience have been uh, some of those people uh, that we should take a moment uh, and you know, congratulate ourselves, we made some progress here. There's a lot of work still, be done, still to be done, but um, uh, yeah, we have been making progress. So, you know, one of the big uh, things that have happened is that we've got all these tier one uh, ASs, uh, the transit free, we also either talk, talk, talk about them as transit free networks or default free, uh, default free zone. Uh, you know, this is NTT, um, Aurelion, which was Telia, Akoj, and Telstra, uh, all these networks, Lumen, uh, that are rejecting invalids. And this has a big uh, impact on uh, uh, containing uh, the impact of origination leaks. Uh, the flip side of that is um, ROAs. There's been a lot of ROA creation. Uh, this graph comes from NIST. So this is uh, from another uh, U.S. federal agency. We have a lot of them. Uh, this is one uh, NIST studies and publishes on technical uh, technical standards. Uh, a lot of things. They have a team that studies routing security specifically. A very sharp group. Uh, they have a website that they maintain that has publishes a lot of stats uh, on a ongoing basis around uh, routing security, specifically around RPI. This is one uh, where they're just tracking in the global routing table how many routes uh, have uh, are unknown, meaning there's no ROA, or how many are valid. Uh, there is also a plot of invalid. So there are always at any given time a handful of routes that are uh, 
persistently invalid due to misconfigurations in the ROA, unfortunately, and 99% of those are due to the max prefix length setting where they someone that forgot what they set it at or for, uh, not sure how these uh, come to be. But if you were to go look at what, what are the persistent invalids, uh, there's there's not that many and uh, and they've made a mistake on the, uh, you know, they need to adjust the max prefix length setting and the ROA. But in the meantime, if you can see, there's like an inflection point from a few, couple of years ago where the, uh, the plots start converging. In fact, if you were to extend this out, uh, this is a graph from last year. If you go look at it today, the lines are even closer and we can project out that probably within the next six months, the lines will cross. We'll have more valid routes than unknown. Uh, that's, that's a lot of progress that, uh, makes a lot, uh, that helps a lot. But I guess what I was interested in last year was since I work at a company, Kentic, uh, you know, the thing that we are known for is NetFlow analytics. So we have, you know, maybe 350 uh, companies, maybe there's a current count. Uh, folks, uh, most of these uh, are networks that send us their NetFlow. We process it, analyze it, and provide uh, rich analytics, uh, which uh, we have got plenty of people who would love to talk to you about it if you want more details on that. But as an analyst, it gives me this uh, great view of the internet where you have, I have a slice across the internet of the traffic that's going through it at any given time. And I can take that and look at uh, how many, how much traffic is destined for routes with valid ROAs. So when I wrote this last year, it was about one third of B2B routes had ROAs and that's both for V4 and V6. Um, but when I looked at in bits per second, traffic going to routes with ROAs, uh, we would see the majority of it uh, going. Um, and that's because of uh, some major content providers and access networks that had done RPKI deployments. So in the United States, we had Spectrum and Comcast, which had, which are a couple of our biggest uh, residential broadband providers. They are the biggest eyeball networks in the United States. Uh, when they have, uh, when they do uh, RPKI deployments, that affects a lot of traffic. On the flip side, you've got uh, Google, Akamai. Cloudflare, uh, all the major content providers as well have done, uh, Amazon have done uh, RPI deployments. And so then that's traffic going in that direction. So while th those companies may represent a small minority of the B2B routes uh, by the numbers, if you look at the volume of traffic, they account for uh, the majority of it as a result. And so that was, um, so we, I guess I, I pointed this out to just, uh, Suggests that we've maybe we've made even more progress than we thought. If we're just counting, uh, just counting routes or counting, you know, ripe stat has a, a thing where they count IP addresses. And I'm here to tell you that we're actually doing better because the uh, the networks that are the biggest source and destination of traffic are uh, a lot of them have uh, done RPKI deployments. And then uh, the the flip side, so that was just about ROAs. How many networks have ROAs? If we have the most traffic. Uh, majority of traffic goes to routes with ROAs. Um, well, who cares? So what? If nobody's uh, rejecting invalid routes, then that is a pointless statistic. Uh, and so there's been a lot of analysis and study around how many networks are rejecting uh, 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 invalids, or particularly invalid routes. And there is, um, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of debate over methodology there. I, I kind of sidestep that a little bit. Uh, I, I don't doubt that the number is probably a small percentage, but it's again, a little like the previous stat, it gets affected by who uh, is doing what. Uh, so in this case, um, I, what I want to see was, or I had just been coming across when I was doing my B2B analysis was the fact that when, when a route is RPI invalid, it's global propagation is diminished significantly um, if not it's cut in half or or even more uh, when it's uh, deemed uh, rpi invalid most of that comes from uh, those uh, dfc tier one uh, networks we mentioned a couple slides ago rejecting invalids because they have a an outsized impact on the customer base their customer cone is enormous so if they reject a route uh, it prevents a lot of the internet from seeing it um, so that's uh, that's great. So we just have a handful of maybe have a handful of networks that um, maybe account for cutting propagation in half. And that is the whole project. Uh, the point of the whole project is that we uh, never did anyone believe that you'd have 100 percent of the Internet adopting uh, and implementing RPI. Uh, but we can uh, if we can have a. Uh, 
um, a, a, a plurality or at least uh, the major networks that have the resources to do this to uh, start create ROAs, reject invalids, uh, then we can contain these outages into um, smaller parts of the internet and limit the disruption because more propagation is more disruption when these things take place. So uh, this was a, a, uh, an analysis I did here, again, just backing up those, those statements. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. Uh, again, the link's not clickable in this video, of course, but uh, there's the slides are available and uh, you're welcome to uh, dig into the analysis. And if you have any questions, feel free to you know, write me when you read those. So, uh, you know, the two truths and a lie here, we've got the majority of traffic is directed to RPK valid routes. That ought to be motivation for you to create, uh, to, excuse me, to, re uh, to reject, um, uh, reject invalids. Uh, so there's two parts to making uh, RPK work. You have to reject invalids and for your address space, you have to create a ROA. Uh, and, uh, if you knew that the majority of traffic is going to uh, RPKI valid routes, you'd like to reject invalids because that protects how you egress traffic out to the internet. It'll protect you. You get something out of this too. Um, and then route propagation is cut in half when something's RPKI invalid. Well, that you ought to interpret as motivation to create a ROA for the address space that you uh, that is yours, and so that the internet and this whole system can then protect you when you know a uh, a country decides that they're gonna, you know, uh, try to censor uh, and black hole your your routes, or there's an origination leak or something. Uh, the, the internet will know how to uh, protect your routes, so that's that's what's in it for you. And yeah, bridging gap protocol, that's the lie. All right, so uh, moving on. So let's a lot of the stuff we've been talking about thus far has been accidental or mostly accidental um, uh, there's also another world to this of, uh, of folks that are uh, actively manipulating uh, internet traffic uh, this is the determined adversary slot uh, part of the, the spectrum uh, these are a couple of, of photos of people manipulating traffic I think um, so the I think this, from my perspective, this starts in 2008 when there was this uh, Black Hat talk about how one could use BGP to try to create a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, when I was at Renesis in 2013, we discovered what we believe is the first in the wild man-in-the-middle uh, BGP attack uh, coming from Belarus. Uh, it used BGP communities to try to shape propagation. So one of the things, if you announce more specific, you don't want the whole internet to pick it up. Otherwise, you have no way to do a man in the middle. You need to have a clear path back to the uh, intended destination um, if you want to uh, make a, a man have traffic redirected to you and then be able to continue on uh, to its destination. So we could see that they were using communities to shape propagation, targeting U.S. financial institutions like Visa, MasterCard, uh, lots of foreign ministries of uh, numerous governments. Um, there was a Wired article about this and um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of coverage. So that was, um, I think, when we started to see uh, some of this determined adversary activity. But uh, you know, as of late, I'd say that a lot of it centers around targeting cryptocurrency services. Uh, cryptocurrency is just catnip for uh, bad actors in the cyberspace because if they can, uh, they can steal something, they can do it instantaneously. There's no recourse and uh, it's gone. So it, it's a great you know, in, th in that respect, it's a great thing to go after. Uh, and you know, going back to April uh, uh, 2018, we saw this Ether Ether Wallet um, uh, attack, and uh, uh, there's the Clay Swap one uh, from 20, uh, 2022. I'll talk about uh, at the beginning of last year, and then Seller Ridge uh, just happened. We'll talk about each of these uh, incidents. There was actually another one that just took place a few weeks ago uh, for Balancer. Uh, if you use that service, that was also subject to a, an attack. Uh, there was, it seemed to be there was a BGP uh, hijack that was involved. It was a hijack of Cloudflare was the uh, authoritative DNS for Balancer. It's, it was hijacked. Um, however, from the report from Balancer, they said that they, uh, in that case, it was um, social engineering of their registrar that affected it. So um, I'm not quite sure if BGP ended up playing a role in the end, but we, you know, I, we did see uh, some activity there. 
Uh, maybe there's more to come on that. So let's just uh, run through these quickly. So, you know, April 28, uh, 2018, this was the uh, incident where uh, there was a, an attack of this hosting provider in Ohio uh, that uh, then began hijacking um, uh, author uh, Amazon's authoritative DNS, this is Route 53. Uh, so that's, you know, the service that controls where does a domain point to. And in this case, it was my Ether wallet, so it was a cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, it redirected to a uh, uh, another uh, you know an imposter site that looked identical. Um, it did have a uh, um, a TLS error that the users had to click through and accept the error. So that was um, you know on them, I guess. Uh, but if they did log in, then they had their wallet, uh, the cryptocurrency stolen. Um, uh, and then we've seen this evolve from there. Uh, uh, this clay swap incident from last year was a little bit more uh, complex. So clay swap was a um, or is a cryptocurrency exchange in South Korea, uh, and the attackers realized that when the the page loads, uh, the, their web services load, it loads a library from another hosting provider and Kakao, and so instead of going after the cryptocurrency exchange directly, they were able to hijack the um, uh, the the, ser the hosting operator that was um, serving up this uh, JavaScript library. And when um, uh, the library was loaded, it contained malicious, malicious code that could redirect uh, cryptocurrency. So uh, that was uh, a bit more sophisticated. And um, uh, some of this, we're, you know, we're starting to get into areas where uh, you may, we may or may not be able to prevent that with existing um, uh, technologies like RPKI, uh, depending on you know how far uh, a route needs to propagate. In this case, uh, it just needed to uh, you know if let's say you hijack Cacao and that and it's RPKI invalid, it doesn't propagate very far. The fact that it doesn't propagate very far may not help here if it is the case that uh, the clay swap service accepts the the bad route. So. Um, uh, yeah, this one, it, there's a lot of discussion going on of how to try to address some of these more sophisticated attacks. And then, you know, the Seller Bridge incident, this one had RPKI involved. So let's talk about that and why that was still successful uh, in spite of RPKI. So this is a service that helps convert between cryptocurrencies. Uh, and the attacker uh, performed a BGB hijack against AWS. So they're going right after one of the most sophisticated uh, hosting operations in the world. Um, they yeah, this was successful, so let's talk about that. So one of the things that the attackers realized was that uh, in order for their bogus announcements to not get filtered by uh, automatically uh, generated whitelist or black, blacklist or whitelist, excuse me, was uh, they needed to increase uh, insert bogus uh, route objects into some sort of a uh, an RAR uh, service, and so they found that AltDB was one that uh, the security seemed to be pretty low. They were able to trick it into adding um, route objects for Quick Host, which is this operator in the UK that, uh, uh, that in the end, ended up emanating some of these routes and being important to the attack. So I uh, added these route objects, and what uh, happening is that Aurelion, or formerly Telia, was a transit provider for Quick Host. The attacker realized that uh, Aurelion would build whitelists based on the RIRs, including AltDB. So as soon as they could get this record into AltDB, then then it would be uh, whitelisted uh, by uh, Aurelion. And then announcement that they uh, uh, they uh, announced through QuickHost would propagate out to the internet, um, and that's what happened. So uh, we saw this AS path uh, here. For those of you who read a lot of BGP, this ought to look. Um, Maybe a little suspicious here. So you have uh, the origin. You read it right to left. So the origin would be one four six one eight. That is um, AWS in Northern Virginia, um, and now it is getting announced by this quick host, this four by AS two zero nine two four three, and then on to Telia. So at a glance, that's unusual that Amazon would be using this small operator to reach a, a tier one network, um, but it was not caught by uh, the Amazon monitoring. So the malicious route, uh, this visualization here is something I like to do where we're just looking at the propagation uh, through time. 
uh, there was a few different periods it pulsed on, turned off, pulsed on, turned off, and there was a handful of uh, during those periods of time, the uh, the attack was in op uh, was operating and pulling uh, cryptocurrency out of uh, uh, people using this service, and eventually uh, Amazon caught on. They announced their own route uh, that tried to that would uh, compete with the hijack route. Although by the time they did that, the attack was long over. In fact, it was over. Um, over an hour after the attack was gone, uh, uh, it was over. Was when they uh, began to react. So, um, so why was this possible? Aside from adding that um, that AltDB record, there was another piece uh, involved. So Amazon had a row of for the hijack prefix. So why was that? Uh, why did that not help here? Um, my position, although I've gotten pushback from Amazon, is that you know, they have very liberal. Uh, ROAs. So we mentioned a number of slides ago back in the Allegheny attack uh, incident when uh, Cloudflare said had Verizon been rejecting invalids, RPI invalids, then this they wouldn't have been impacted. I would agree with that. Um, uh, but that was only because the ROAs had a max prefix length, this optional field in a ROA that matched the routes. In this case, uh, they have very liberal ROAs. So for the address base coming out of Amazon, uh, it is allowed to be announced by multiple uh, Amazon ASs and the range, the prefix range, uh, uh, allowable uh, prefix sizes can go from slash 10 to slash 24, which is a pretty huge range. So any, basically any any size is acceptable and a few different ASs are acceptable as origins. It just creates a lot of room, in my opinion, for an attacker to take advantage of this uh, scenario. And uh, you know, had they had max prefix length matching the routes, it would be very hard for uh, the attacker to then would then have to contend with Amazon and fight directly uh, for you know, how far the routes would propagate and it probably would have done less damage. I make I, I mentioned this and I um, want to take a point to uh, take a moment to mention this RFC 9319, which is worth uh, looking into. This is uh, uh, a fairly recent uh, publication that recommends um, not using the max prefix length field, which uh, is not well known that this is optional, but it is an optional field. And if you don't use it, then you just match on the origin and you don't worry about the uh, 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 the, the length of the prefix. <clears throat> so it's something worth considering and uh, or at least taking a look at the RFC. Right, and so what we'll ultimately need is some kind of BGP sec. And so BGP sec would be this cryptographic uh, 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 signing of a route uh, between ASs. Uh, this is not a field of technology. There's a lot of debate over whether this is even possible. Uh, it is something that's uh, continuously under discussion. Uh, the, the concern is that it may be too computationally taxing for a router, especially uh, you know, we have very large routers uh, handling a lot of messages. There, you know, big ones may be handling you know, millions of messages a minute um, and trying to uh, perform a, a cryptographic check on every one, maybe too much uh, is the is the concern. Um, so that notwithstanding, um, the other concern is that if you don't have every AS uh, uh, being uh, on board with BGB sec, then you break this chain, this custody chain as an announcement goes to the internet. And then as soon as you break that chain, you've lost any uh, security. Uh, having said that, there's still uh, an argument to be made that there's va there's value in having contiguous um, have, having a partial deployment, uh, and the value between contiguous contiguous uh, ASs could still do a lot of uh, provide a lot of benefit. Uh, and so, in this case, uh, it would have been had Aurelion and Amazon, two companies that probably have got the resources and the wherewithal to deploy BGB sec if it were so uh, specified and built. Uh, if they were uh, peering and they, um, uh, Aurelion received a, a route, the same route from Amazon and the same route from QuickHost without uh, a BGP sec at a station, then it would, it would prefer the one from Amazon and the uh, attack wouldn't have happened. But again, we're, we're not there yet. This isn't a, a, a technology that's, that's yet fielded. 
So I say there's uh, more progress to come here. So uh, I, uh, we've peer lock is another technology out there that tries to prevent uh, uh, routing leaks just among the DFZ. So again, those those providers uh, should know that they shouldn't be able to accept a route uh, from uh, from one uh, adjacency uh, from one network for. Uh, for another, so uh, you can't cross three uh, networks uh, at the DFC. Uh, so using that knowledge, then there's a way you can populate uh, filters, and that's that's what PeerLock is about. Um, uh, so there's been a lot of work in RPI, BGPSec. I just discussed. Uh, that's you know still under discussion. ASPA is uh, a, a way to try to uh, it would address some of these adjacency leaks where providers would assert in in the RPI infrastructure, uh, who are their transit providers, and then ASs would be able to use that information to identify uh, uh, mistakes in the uh, AS path and uh, and uh, potentially reject them. And you know, for those who don't know, there's a guy named Joop Snyders who I uh, collaborate with from time to time. He's probably our leading uh, voice on uh, trying to improve routing security. This is my little little joke with him, but um, uh, you can expect if you're if you follow this topic at all, you'll you'll hear uh, uh, something of his. And um, uh, I guess I would say I would leave on a positive note that I believe we're, we're moving the needle here from uh, the perspective of the last 13 years. I think things we're moving this needle over uh, up towards the German adversary. And now we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what are the, the remaining security improvements we need to do to address these, uh, the address the determined adversary scenario. They're very hard. There's a lot of work to be done, but um, we have made a lot of progress and uh, that should be, um, I think that should be encouraging for everyone. So, uh, having said that, uh, that concludes my talk, and I would be very happy to uh, take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Doug. And like you said, we're ready to move on to the Q&A. So as a reminder to our audience, please take time to submit any remaining questions you have using the Q&A tab on the left side of your screen. We already have a lot of great questions, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So with that said, our first question, Doug, when, if ever, do you think BGP will be a secure protocol? Um, I think it's like any of these technologies that we, we use, uh, there's probably going to always be a cat and mouse race as we, uh, we field uh, security uh, defenses. People find ways around them. We have a very complex system uh, to, uh, of how the internet operates. So um, I, I don't know that we will ever get to a point where this is a completely solved problem, uh, but we are just trying to uh, incrementally make it better uh, every year. Definitely. Um, kind of in a similar vein, are there any alternatives to using BGP? One of our audience members notes having heard of a proposal called Scion to replace BGP. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, no, there really is no alternative to BGP. Uh, this is really hard, hard coded, hard, hard baked into uh, the internet as it operates today. So there, the Scion is one of, uh, there's been a few academic pr proposals uh, to improve, to address some of the security concerns. Um, the truth is that to deploy something is just not, it's just not practical. It's kind of like, um, you know, if you and I decided that Esperanto is really a, a much better language than uh, English uh, for a variety of reasons, grammatical spelling, everything. So starting tomorrow, let's speak Esperanto. It's just not going to happen uh, despite the benefits. So um, I think uh, we are going to have uh, it, it's kind of remarkable for anyone who ha or has a familiarity with routing protocols. Uh, so BGP is one routing protocol. There's lots of OSPF, uh, uh, ISIS. There's lots of uh, uh, protocols out there. For BGP, this is BGP version four, and the global the global internet operates on a single instance of this one protocol, and it will be that way until the day we die. There's really no way to, uh, at this point, uh, to change that because it is so um, uh, baked into the internet. And I just, uh, I think our time would probably be better spent on trying to figure out what are the, um, uh, what are the uh, ways we can incrementally improve the existing infrastructure than trying to replace it because I just don't think it's realistic that we'll, uh, we'll replace it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... 
I have another bit of an in-depth question. Um, so the audience member wants to know, in my company's network, sometimes peers send us more specific routes for the purposes of traffic engineering. And sometimes these routes are RPKI invalid due to the maximum prefix length specified in the corresponding ROA. What is the best practice for handling these unique situations? Um, they either need to reject the route or disable ROV to make this work, but how would you recommend handling? Yeah, this this is a legitimate um, uh, concern that I hear a lot, and uh, I, there, I would say that there's an active discussion on how to deal with this because uh, there are some scenarios where, again, for traffic engineering purposes, uh, networks use more specifics. Another scenario, uh, this, is, this is talking about traffic engineering, like if you had a uh, a peer or content provider that announced and just just into your network some more specifics and need to let those come in another scenario that's similar to that is uh for ddos mitigation where a ddos uh mitigation provider will announce more specifics in like a slash 32 or a you know like for an individual ip to try to attract the the ddos traffic out of the network um and in order and that if there is a max prefix length set on that address space it probably won't allow that slash 32 or the individual ip uh, um, and, uh, so you have to not, um, yeah, you have to not use, um, you have to not use disable ROV to, in order to allow that to happen. So, um, we are, um, uh, I, there isn't a great answer at the moment for that. And it's something that's discussed. And, uh, there's a, there's a IETF discussion around that, uh, of, of proposal, but I'd say that there's, there are these niche, uh, scenarios of, um, where, Rejecting invalids um, doesn't help with, you know, the traffic engineering or the, um, um, yeah, the uh, <coughs> DDoS uh, mitigation scenario. Mm -hmm. Very helpful uh, and detailed sure. answer. Um, and I know just because for the sake of time, we have another situational based answer, um, but yeah. this, for the sake of time, will be our final question for today. Um, the audience member wants to know if they are an ISP and they create an RPKI for their allocated subnet. And just for an example, it's a they're using a 22, which has two 24 customers, one using their own AS, which will need their own RPKI and one using their own AS as origin as they don't have an AS. Do they need to use an ROA for each dash 24 with prefix limit, or can they use an ROA for the dash 22 with prefix limit dash 24? Very situational question. Yeah. Um, let's see if I understand that correctly. Um, you can have multiple ROAs for address space. So um, uh, again, if I'm understanding this correctly, you, you, you could potentially cover yourself by having can allow multiple correct uh, answers. Um, so your the question is about creating ROAs, uh, and let's see. Uh, so one has two customers. One uh, needs to use the parent company's AS, and the other one. Uh, so I, I guess I would. I think you could accomplish this with two ROAs. Uh, if I understood this correctly, uh, you would have one for the parent company. Uh, it's AS from 22, and the max prefix length could be set at um, 24, and then you could create an additional ROA uh, that just handles the other customer that has another uh, AS. And so for that other customer, there's two ROAs that cut, that may be that may, uh, would be correspond to that address space. Um, but that's okay. You don't have to match all of them. You just have to match one of them. And, uh, and so I think you can do that with two. But um, if, I, if I mangled that at all, uh, feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to either uh, try my best at answering or refer you to someone who can give you some better advice. But uh, I, think, I think you can do it in two. Perfect. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We had a lot of great questions come through today, and we unfortunately couldn't get to them all, but we'll do our best to get back to everyone who submitted a question personally following today's webinar. Um, and I want to thank you all for attending this Fierce Telecom webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd also like to thank our speaker, Doug, for participating and Ken Tick for presenting today's presentation. A recorded version of this webinar will be available for you to access within 24 hours using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. 
Thank you again for joining and we look forward to seeing you at future events.